But let's turn today to the book of Hebrews. And if I were to ask you, show me some pictures of your family, your children. I imagine that you could do that right now. That you could take out your purse ladies or your wallet men and show me a picture of your children. And that's exactly what God is going to do in this passage of Scripture that we're getting ready to look at. God is going to show us seven pictures of His Son. You see, God loves His Son just the way you love your children. And God is proud of His Son just the way you're proud of your children. And so here in Hebrews, God begins by saying, You want to know about my Son? Let me tell you about my son. And God gives us seven snapshots of Jesus in these first three verses. Beautiful pictures that remind us that every day with Jesus is sweeter than the day before. So let's stand together and take a look at these in Hebrews chapter 1, beginning with verse 1 going through verse 3. God, who at various times and in various ways spoke in time past to the fathers by the prophets, has in these last days spoken to us by his Son, whom he has appointed heir of all things, through whom also he made the worlds, who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person, And upholding all things by the word of his power, when he had by himself purged our sins, sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. Our Father, we thank you for your son Jesus. And we thank you for these pictures of him that you give to us today to show us how much you love him. And to help us to love him too. And we pray in these moments together that you will just help us to focus on Jesus and make much of him. It is in his name we pray. And the church said, amen. Amen. Thank you. Please be seated. Now I'm just going to give you these seven pictures of Jesus that God gives to you and me here in his word. Now, I want you to imagine God the Father just showing you these seven pictures and saying, let me tell you about my son. And he begins to do that by showing you each of these pictures of Jesus. He begins there in that second verse. Look at what it says that he has in these last days spoken unto us by his son, whom he has appointed heir of all things. That's first picture. God said, let me show you my son. He is the heir of all things. That's the first picture God gives us of his son. When God created Adam and Eve and placed them in the garden of Eden, God gave Adam and Eve the title deed to the earth. He gave them dominion over the earth. Now I want to show you that. Keep your place and turn to Genesis chapter 1. Genesis chapter 1, and look with me at verse 28 in Genesis 1. Genesis chapter 1, verse 28 says, Then God blessed them, and God said to them, Be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth and subdue it, have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, and over every living thing that moves on the earth. So what is going on there? God is giving Adam and Eve dominion over the earth. It was theirs to enjoy. It was theirs to explore. It was theirs to experience. But Adam and Eve sinned against God. And when they sinned, They lost the dominion over the earth that God had given them. The devil took it away from them. 
And that's why today we have evil and we have suffering and, and we have death because Scripture says that the devil roams this earth seeking whom he may devour, that he's like a, a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. But the Bible says here in Hebrews that Jesus Christ is the heir of all things. In other words, that means the earth rightfully belongs to him. And ladies and gentlemen, listen to me. There is coming a day when Jesus is going to take it back. There's coming a day. I want to show you this in the book of the Revelation. Turn over to the last book of the Bible. We just read out of the first book. Now let's go to the last book, the Revelation. And we're going to look here at a particular verse in chapter 5. And in this fifth chapter, we read about a peculiar book. It is called a seven-sealed book. And all of heaven is looking for someone who is worthy to open this seven-sealed book to claim the title deed to the universe. And you can read about it in verse 4, but I want to pick it up with verse 7. It says, then he came. He is referring to Jesus. You notice it's capitalized in your Bible. And it says, then he came. That's really all we need to hear. Amen? Then he came. That's enough. You know, two things you can learn about God. And I think we mentioned this last week. And I know I've mentioned it in conversations with people this week. God is enough and God is able. You remember those two things. God is enough and God is able. So it says, then he came and took the scroll out of the right hand of him who sat on the throne. So what this means is there is coming a day when Jesus Christ will take back the title deed of the universe, he will take it from the devil because it does not belong to the devil. It belongs to Jesus because God says he is the heir of all things. God said, look at my son. And you will see this first picture. He is the heir of all things. And then he shows us a second snapshot of his son. And we read about that back in Hebrews in chapter 1. Look at verse 2. Hebrews 1, 2 says, Through whom also he made the worlds. You see, God is saying now in this second picture of his son that Jesus is the creator of all things. He is the creator of all things. And this is an amazing concept when we think about this universe and how everything came into existence. In fact, the Bible tells us how it happened. Listen to this verse. Jot down Colossians 1.16 and listen to it. Scripture says, For by Him, by Jesus, all things were created that are in heaven and that are on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or principalities our powers, all things were created through him and for him. So God said, I want you to see this picture of my son. He is the, the creator of all things. Just take this galaxy, for example, that we live in called the, the Milky Way galaxy. Right now, this galaxy that, that we live in is 100,000 light years across. Now that's more than we can comprehend. 100,000 light years across the Milky Way galaxy. That's 400 trillion miles across. And scientists tell us that this is probably just one of 200 trillion galaxies. And our telescopes now are so sophisticated that they demonstrate to us that we are in an ever-expanding universe, and that proves that this universe had to have a beginning. And you know why? Because God says, here's my son Jesus, and he's the creator of all. 
Jesus, is, take your heart, for example, beating in your chest right now. In an average lifetime, a heart will beat 600 million times. It will pump enough blood to fill tanks all the way from New York City to Boston. Yet you don't have to tell your heart to beat. It beats during the daytime and it beats during the nighttime. And that's because Scripture says in John 1, 3, all things were made through him and without him was nothing made that was made. And the amazing thing here is that when Jesus creates, he makes something out of nothing. Man cannot do that. The tense of the word create in the Old Testament implies that creation was an act where Jesus brought something out of nothing. God said, light be, and light was. And God spoke this universe into existence. Now let me show you why God wanted us to see this picture of his son. In 2 Corinthians 5.17, the Bible says, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a what? A new creation. And then it says, old things are passed away. Behold, or, or look, all things have become new. You see, you may feel like a, a nothing this morning, but the Bible says if Jesus Christ has saved your soul, that you are a new creation. That God has made you new. God takes a, a nobody like me and can make me somebody because Jesus recreates me. He saves me. And so Jesus is the, the creator of all things. And God said, don't you forget that. This is a picture of my son, he said. He is the creator of all things. Then go back to Hebrews 1. And we see a third picture of Jesus. In verse 3, it simply says, Who being in the brightness of of his glory. And the word brightness means radiance. So God is showing us a picture here saying Jesus is the radiance of God's glory. He is the radiance of God's glory. The word brightness or radiance means to, to shine. You know, there's a difference between moonlight and sunlight. Moonlight is a reflection of sunlight. The moon does not generate light. It simply reflects the light of the sun. But the sun is different. The sun does not reflect light. The sun radiates light. And in this verse of Scripture, it says that Jesus Christ is the radiance of God's glory. Ask the Apostle Paul about that before he was saved. When he was on the way to Damascus to persecute the church, to kill the believers. And in the book of Acts, it says that he saw a light. A light that was brighter than the noonday sun. The radiance of God's glory. And he said, who are you, Lord? And you remember what the voice said? I am Jesus. I am Jesus. And that is the radiance of God's glory. And then here's the next picture. Look at what it says. Hebrews verse 3. It says, and the express image of his person. The express image of his person. Jesus is the express image of God. That little phrase, express image, means that Jesus Christ is the perfect imprint, the exact representation of God. In John 14, 9, Jesus said, He who has seen me has seen the Father. In Colossians 1, 15, referring to Jesus, it says, He is the image of of the invisible God. You want to know what God looks like? Look at Jesus. You want to know what God is like? Look at Jesus. None of us can know God apart from Jesus because Jesus is God. And God says here in Hebrews, let me show you a picture of my son. He is the express image of God. God's saying, you want to see what I'm like? Look at him. Like father, like son. Like son, like father. He's a chip off the old block. Amen? Amen. Now go back to Hebrews 1.3 and look at this fifth picture. 
the Bible says, and upholding all things by the word of his power. Jesus is upholding all things. God said, here's another picture that he's upholding all things. Jesus not only created all things by his word, but he holds all things together by the word of his power. Now, have you ever stopped to think about the amount of power that is required to hold this world together? For example, man has discovered the atom and how powerful the atom is. And one of the mysteries of physics is what keeps an atom together because the neutrons in the atom are all positively charged and the atom should tear apart. Now, I'm no physicist, but I know what holds the atom together. It's Jesus. Jesus upholds all things. The Lord Jesus holds all things together. This universe would come unglued without his constant supervision and power. And one of these days, Scripture says that Jesus is going to take his hand off. And when he does, the Bible says this universe is going to come apart. God's going to reach in and take away all which defiles and all the the sin. And then he's going to put it all together in a brand new heaven and a, a brand new earth for us to enjoy. Be so beautiful we won't even remember what this one looked like. And how can he do it? Because he holds all things together. You know the difference between Christian thought and Eastern religion is really this. Eastern thought believes that everything goes in a circle. Eastern religion has a cyclical view of life, and that's why so often they believe in reincarnation. They believe you get recycled. If you're good, you might come back as a wealthy person. If you're bad, you might come back as a bug. You just get recycled if you're good or if you're bad. But Christianity teaches that everything is moving toward a a destination. And Jesus started it all. And Jesus sustains it all. And when it all gets done, Jesus is going to be there to wrap it up. Because Jesus upholds all things. And now here's a point I want you to get. If Jesus can do this with creation then whatever burden you are bearing right now in your life, whatever problem you are dealing with in your life, and you brought it into this building, Jesus, if He can uphold this universe, then Jesus can uphold you, and Jesus can support you. So I want to give you a word of encouragement this morning. You may think that you're not going to make it, but you are going to make it, If you are a born-again child of God, God has a plan and a purpose for your life, and Jesus will uphold you because the Bible says Jesus upholds all things. And I want to remind you that. You remember when the disciples were in the boat and they were in the midst of the sea and the storm and they they thought they were going under and, and they were afraid, but they learned something. They weren't in that boat to go under. They were in that boat to go over because Jesus upholds all things. Now, I don't know what you're going through, but I know that Jesus will see you through. Jesus upholds all things. And then there are two more snapshots here I want you to see and we're finished. Look again at verse 3. It says, When he had by himself purged our sins. Now this is a beautiful picture of Jesus. God says, let me show you my son. He is the redeeming Savior. He is the redeeming Savior. And the tense of the verb here means something that happened at one point in time That never needs to be repeated. In just one stroke of the pen, the writer of Hebrews shows us the eternal Jesus, who is the creator, is also our redeemer who purged our sin when he gave up himself on Calvary's cross. You know, Jesus could have come off of that cross. He went to the cross, willingly went to the cross. Why did he do it? Well, 1 John 1, 7 says, The blood of Jesus Christ cleanses us from all sin. 
Revelation 1.5 says, Unto him who loved us and washed us once and forever from our sin in his own blood. He is our redeeming Savior. And today we're free because Christ bought us with his blood. And when we place our faith in him, our sin is forgiven. And then here's the final snapshot, the picture in this text today in verse 3. God says here, you want to see my son? You want to know what my son is like? Look at this picture in verse 3. It says, and he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. And he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. If you study the tabernacle in Scripture, you will find that there are seven pieces of furniture in the tabernacle. But the one article of furniture that you will not find in the tabernacle is a chair. There's no chair in the tabernacle. And if you turn over to Hebrews 10, I'll show you why. Hebrews chapter 10, just turn there with me. And look at what it says now in verse 11 and in verse 12. And every priest stands ministering daily and offering repeatedly the same sacrifices which can never take away sins. But this man, notice man is capitalized, that's referring to Jesus. But this man, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down at the right hand of God. You see, the priest stood. They repeatedly offered sacrifices. What does this say? This says that Jesus is the finisher of our faith. He is the finisher of our faith. This man Jesus came from the bosom of the Father to be born in the womb of a virgin. In infancy, he startled a king. In boyhood, he confounded the scholars. In manhood, he ruled over nature. On the cross, he conquered sin. In the tomb, he conquered death. And now God says, let me introduce you to my son. He is the finisher of our faith. And he is seated today at the right hand of the throne of God. He is the Lord of history. He is the Lord of glory. He is my Lord. Is he your Lord? The finisher of our faith. You know, if we could have a conversation with God and God would say, Here's my son, these seven pictures. And after he showed us these seven pictures of his son, I think God would say, now you go and make much of Jesus. Just go and make much of Jesus. That's what worship is. Worship is just making much of Jesus. And we're going to stand after our prayer and have a song of invitation. And we're going to invite you today to make much of Jesus by opening your heart and life to receive Him as Savior. And if you would make that decision, we invite you to come forward publicly, publicly to receive Christ when we start to sing, you come. And if you would like to unite with the church today, you come. You come as we sing. Our Father, we thank you. We love you. We praise you for Jesus, the finisher of our faith, in whose name we pray. And the church said, amen. Amen. Let's stand here and in the Christian Life Center, and we sing.